So, have you had a good morning? Have you been worshipping well? Yes? You sounded amazing when I came in, which is really good. Who here, I've got a question for you. Who here has heard of love at first sight? Yes, as in just regular love at first sight. Somebody told me that that's a movie, that it might be a series. I don't, that's not what I mean, love at first sight. Who's ever experienced love at first sight? Yeah? I think I did many times before I actually did. You know how you think you have? You know when you're in high school and you're like, you're just checking out that other person across the room? Or uh, in, in my case, I used to catch the train to school, take me an hour to get to school with train and tram and bus and all that kind of stuff. And so I'd be, you know, like I'd be in the train or the train or the tram or something like this and I'd be like, oh, who, oh, oh, who's just got onto the tram? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, that person, they just got in the way. Oh, instant love. You know, <laughs> you know that moment where you just go, oh, and suddenly you're like, you've gone from an average day, it's just like, oh, I'm just going to school, yeah, oh, God, have I done my assignments, you know what I mean? You go from that to sort of like, I'm on top of the world, hey, I'm on top of the world, hey, you know that song? And you're just like, you're suddenly in a moment, your life has changed, because you think you found the one. Isn't everyone the one until you realise that they're not the one? <laughs> Praise God, I found the one. But you know, so a lot, I think there was a few false starts along the way, if I'm honest, if I'm really honest. But, you know, in a moment, your life can change. And who knows also that the opposite can happen or the same thing can happen in the opposite direction. One minute, you're on top of the world. One minute, or, or one minute, maybe just everything's just cruising and it's just average and it's good. And the next minute, you feel like you've just fallen headlong down a gully. The, the crazy thing is that I want to tell you that no matter how, whether that's happened to you or not, it's pretty common across the human race. And in fact, if you read your Bible, you'll find very quickly as you look at your Bible heroes that most of them experience both of those situations. Poles apart, but most of us experience both of those situations where one minute it seems like everything's cool, next minute everything's not so good. I was reading one Psalm, Psalm 139 and most of us would know that Psalm because it's it's a psalm where it says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and how God knit us together and knows all our days. And it's just an awesome psalm, encouraging psalm written by, by David. But I actually looked at it this time and I saw this, this line in verse 8 and it says, If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. How was David able to say that? Did he literally go to heaven? Did he literally go to the grave? We know that he didn't. But he understood what it was like to feel like you've either gone to heaven or you've gone to the grave. He understood what it was to have the mountaintop experience and also to feel like he's just hit rock bottom and there's no way out. You know, it's the power of the suddenly moment. We've stepped into the year of suddenly. 20, we're stepping into that 2019. Suddenly, we're excited about the suddenly moments and the things that God is going to do. It's so cool. I'm so looking forward to it. But you know, a suddenly moment can, be, can either turn a rainy day into sunshine or it can turn a perfect day into a thunderstorm. I reckon, if we're, I reckon if I'm talking to any people that would understand that, it would be us because we are Melburnians. You, whether you've grown up here like I have or whether you have just moved into the neighbourhood, you know, the reality is Melbourne is berated so much, stirred and laughed at so much by all the other cities of Melbourne, of Australia, because they look at us and they go, you're crazy weather. Four seasons in a day. Yeah, thank you. Why do we have to wait till a certain time of year? We don't. We can experience spring and winter all in the same week. Yes. You know, I actually love Melbourne's changeable weather. I don't think, like, Lord, hear me, I'm saying no. So um, I've learned never to say no, no like that to God. But I, I would, I'm rather grateful I don't live in Queensland. Uh, you know what I mean? It's a beautiful place to visit. Sorry to any Queensland viewers on the line. We love you. Please love me still. But I am really grateful that I live here in Melbourne. I actually love Melbourne's changeable weather. I love the fact that one day, it's one, one day it's one thing, one day it's another, or one hour it's one thing, one hour another. I think what it does is it builds something into us. It builds something into us, an ability to handle change. 
So if you go to it, if you live in a place that's perfect one day, amazing the next, like what is there to look forward to? I mean, it's, it's always the same. I just think that's really not, I'd be great for a holiday, but I love Melbourne. I love the fact that what it does is that builds something into our lives. And I think personally, for me, it's been really good because I am a bit of a routine person. I like my cereal every morning. I don't get up in the morning and go, what am I going to eat today? I go, I know what I'm going to eat. The same thing I ate yesterday, the day before, the day before, and the day before. I like my food. I like it. I like regularity. I like that routine. But you know what? Living in Melbourne has been a great thing for me because it's taught me something. It's caused me to learn something, and that is to learn to navigate change when it's happening in my life. You know, whenever our friends come from overseas, they usually, especially the girls, they'll go like, they'll contact me. It's like, what, what, what do I pack? Like, what, what do I wear? What's the weather going to be like? And I, I hold, hold my tongue and I don't say the first thought that comes to my mind, which is your whole wardrobe. Because you put, could possibly need any of it or, or all of it. But I usually just give them the temperatures that are expected during that season. And then I always add to it. And I add this line to it, but the key to Melbourne dressing well, the key to dressing in Melbourne weather is layering. <laughs> layering. You know, it's, layering is effectively ensuring that you always have certain basic essentials to handle any possible change. Yeah. So no matter what's happening. I remember as a young child, I said, um, I remember in primary school, I, probably grade three, grade four, I remember I used to, my way of dealing with the changing weather, I would wear exactly the same clothes every day. I had like I had my own pre my my own chosen uniform, uniform of choice, and I would wear exactly the same thing. So I would wear my co blue colonial V knee jeans because they were cool. Although my sister had the newest ones, which were red, and I wished I had those. But I had the blue colonial V knee jeans. I had my my white Barry Great Barrier Reef t shirt that I'd bought on holiday, but it was so soft. And then I had my white skinny rig jumper with like the lace up. But you know that one that's in the stuff that's in now, yeah, that style, yeah. Been there, done that. They say it's new. I'm so sorry to burst your bubble. And then I'd wear my red quilted parka, which they had like white kind of fake fur on the inside, and my brown school shoes. And I figured that if I wore those clothes, if I had all of those elements together, then that I would be, I would be set to handle whatever came my way. And I, uh, my mum, it was really funny because like the only way she could get it off me was to wait. She had to wait Friday night. I'd gone to sleep. She'd sneak into my bedroom, steal my clothes off my floor, try and get it washed and dried so I'd be ready for Monday because <laughs> she knew that I had to wear it. She knew that I would insist on wearing it. But, you know, I wonder if as Christians, you see, that was my, that was my like, essentials kit. But I wonder if as Christians we realise that God has given to us also a, um, a resources to equip us to handle change well. See, we're going into a year of suddenlies. We're going into a year of suddenly. If you don't know the theme, if you guess with us today, our theme, we've just had Vision Sunday, our theme for next year is suddenly. We believe God has spoken that word over us. And so we are filled with expectation of the good things that God is going to do because, you know, it's not just the bad suddenlies you need to be ready for. It's also the good ones. And I'm actually not looking for a year of bad suddenlies happening, although there may be a few mixed in because I tend to unavoidably, unavoidably sneak into my calendar in some way, into my life in some way. But, the, but it's not just the bad things that will distract us. See, sometimes we think we're all like ready for the bad things. But when something good happens, sometimes that's the very thing that can just knock us off our feet. You know, like the new job. You know, you've been praying, God, I've been diligent at my workplace, Lord. I've been doing this, but I really want to get a better job. Lord, or I really want that promotion at work. Lord, Lord, just get, grant me favour. Like, that's what we pray for, isn't it? We pray that God would give us favour, that he would open doors, that we would go to new levels, that we'd have new places of influence. We do all that, and it's like, God, and, and it comes in, and your boss, he comes in, and they're beaming, they're looking at you, I've got this position. We'd just love to offer it to you. We just think you're going to be awesome. I've just seen your faithfulness. I've just seen how good you are. It'd just be amazing. It's going to have this much of an increase in pay. You might even get a phone or you might get a, something that goes with all these little benefits. It's like, we just think that you're going to be awesome. You just have to work some Sundays for a while. Oh. You know that. could be that. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's the relationship. It's like, God, 
I've been happy in my singleness, you know, like I've been okay with that. I'm, I'm, I'm patient. I'm, I, I trust you, Lord. I'm not worrying about it. But Lord, it'd be really nice to get that tidied up, that section of my life tidied up. Really love to have just like that, the, the one. I just don't want to, I don't want to waste time. I just want to be the one, I want us to get that settled. Then we can go together, like into our destiny. It's awesome. It's amazing. And it's like, yeah, I just want to do that. So then you come across, then God's answering your prayer. It's awesome. Yes, this person. I think they're the one. Not like before. Not like in the train. It's like they are the one. It's like, oh, this is so good. And it's so amazing. And you just love them and they love you. And it's like, oh, so awesome. And then you just suddenly, then you find yourself so consumed with spending time with them. Because they're so amazing and they're the one. Like God's not against that. I may not be able to get to friendship group this week because we've got deep night on. We've got something going. We got we got this, we've got that. You know what I mean? I can't oh. Ah, I'm not going to be able to be in both services because, like, they're only coming to the second one. They want to pick me up. It's like, ah. So I I can't serve the way I used to serve. And the things, and so something amazing has happened. Some great suddenly has occurred. A blessing from God, the answer to your prayer. And yet, it's actually, whoa, without even realizing, maybe it's just thrown you a little off course. So we need to understand that it's not just the bad things that we need to be, we need to be, aware of or handle well see we don't need to fear these things we don't need to be worried about these things we just need to learn to handle them well God wants to teach us to negotiate things to navigate life so that he can take us wherever he wants to take us he can bless us he can do the things he wants to do but it's not going to take us away from him see nothing worse than giving someone a gift and the first thing they do is walk away from you so absorbed with the gift that they're not interested in you anymore I wonder how many times that's happened at Christmas time and it's okay when, things, when kids are kids because they're like, oh, their eyes light up and they just run off with their toy. And it's like, that's fun. But you know what I mean? Like when your adult children do that, I'm not speaking, I don't think I'm speaking from personal experience unless I've forgotten, unless it's scarred me and I've forgotten, I've blocked it out of my memory. But you know, but nothing worse than when your grown up kids get so taken with the gift that now they're not interested. And you go like, hey, um, did you like it? You know what? We don't want to be those people. We want to be those people who understand that the blessing comes from the Father and He wants to give it to us because He loves us, but He wants us to love Him more than the blessing. So we need to understand how to negotiate things well, whether they're good things that come suddenly to us or hard things, because they can be both. You see, the best ships don't just aren't just stable and staying the course through the rough seas and the storms. They're the ones that can continue to move when everything is going cruisy. See, sometimes, I know it's more like sail ships and stuff like this, but they, they, they work it through the storms and stuff, but then you take them out onto a glassy sea when there's no wind and they stop. And God doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to be equipped. He wants us to have like the engine in our inside of us that allows us to continue to move even when things are good. So we don't just go start to put, ourself, put out the deck chair. Oh, well. Sun's out. I think now it's time to rest. You know what? There are times to rest. We need to look after ourselves. But if it's, uh, I'm just going to take a moment, dot, 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 who knows how long that will be. It's kind of like we just want you to work a few Sundays for a little while, dot, 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 dot. It's like when there's no end to that, that's a bit of a concern because who knows how long it will go. And so we need to be those who, who continue no matter what comes to us continue to move forward in the direction of our destination because God has a plan for you God has a purpose for your life you know in chapter 30 of Proverbs there's an unusual request made by a guy called Agur I think that's how you say excuse me how you say it and in verses 7 to 9 it says this it says oh God I beg two favors from you let me have them before I die first help me never to lie that's a good one God help me never to lie Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. If I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. You know what? It's an interesting request. I, I, when I first look at it, when the first time I ever read it, I remember thinking to myself, but I thought God does want to bless us with, you know, he wants to bless your finances. I actually do, seriously do believe that. I think there's enough examples that through the word. Just look at Abraham, father of faith, as one of them. 
And he was known as one of the wealthiest men in the land. And yet he was the man who the heart after God. He was the man who was known as the friend of God. He was the father of our faith. He's a man who walked by faith. But God continued to bless his finances. So I don't think this is just an issue of finances. I think there's, there's maybe more being said in these verses than just riches or poor poverty. I think they're actually, these verses are actually more about learning to live by faith, believing for the suddenly moments and the breakthroughs that we're asking for, but also living undistracted by them when they come. Again, not so distracted with the gift or the hardship. Not so distracted with these things, but going, okay, we're going to believe for the good things. We're going to believe for the suddenlies that you're going to take us through. You're going to do this. But God, we're not going to get distracted by them from who you are, from our relationship with you. Because good or bad, miraculous breakthrough or unexpected hardships, God's purpose and destination for your life does not change. It doesn't change. And both blessing and trial have the potential to distract and uh, distract us if we haven't set our life up in such a way as to handle them well. See, we've, they'll either we'll handle them or they'll handle us, as they say. So we need to understand, okay, God, you want to teach me how to handle this well because this is the year of suddenly. This is the year where you're wanting to do something major. You're wanting to do awesome things. You're going to bring the breakthroughs that we've been praying and asking and believing for. You're doing these things. So, God, we want to be ready for it. So now you're equipping us so that we can handle it. Because you know what? We've got to grow in it. But we'll never grow in it if we're not aware aware of it. Because God wants us to continue to move forward and take a hold of our life and our purpose. You know, recently I received um, a book as a gift from uh, the daughter of friends of ours. You would know them, Pastors Roger and Tina Archer from Four Square Puella over in the USA. Awesome couple. Uh, they've been here before, so many of you would know them. But their daughter, Brittany, has just recently written her first book. And it's a great book. It's called Dancing in the Dark. And it's actually written, as the title implies, it's actually being ri- has been written about um, her journey through a very difficult time in her life. Very difficult time in her life. But what I love about this book is it doesn't major on the event or on the issue that she went through. It tells you enough so that you understand what's happened. But it doesn't major on that. It continues to move forward so that despite what she's walking through and the permanent impact that it's had on her life, the determination that she shows is incredible. Her det- she's absolutely determined not to get distracted from her relationship with Jesus and not to be sidelined just because an unexpected, suddenly turn of events occurred in her life. And she puts it down when you read it, and I'm only just part way through it, but I'm I'm, as, you, as I read this book, I can see she puts it down. She makes it very clear at the beginning. It's because of certain spiritual principles that she put into her life. Like not certain like, you know, special principles, you know, like nobody else has known, special revelations, higher than high or anything like that. But just some, some spiritual principles that we could all do that she's put into her life, godly habits that she brought into place and they were put into place before anything was even on the horizon. So when that tidal wave hit her life, she may have been knocked for a while. She was knocked for a while. But she wasn't going anywhere because her feet were anchored in Jesus Christ. Her relationship with him, she maintained it. She had it in place because she was already had it going before it ever occurred. You know, Matthew 7, verse 24 to 25, it says these, and it's a parable probably we all know. It says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. This is Jesus speaking. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. You know, if you go on, you know the parable, you know that it goes on and talks about another builder who built a house on sand. Who knows that a sandy block that isn't strong and isn't stable is a whole lot cheaper to buy than a, than a solid block of, with good ground. If you've ever bought a block, you understand that, that it's all about the type of ground that you've got there. It's all about the location. It's about what it is. You don't pay good money money for a sandy bland, sandy uh, ground. What you do is you pay good money for the solid stuff. 
And now, so I reckon that this person who built on bedrock was the person who had a choice. So he had a choice. He could have built on sand because it would have been way cheaper. He would have got his house quicker. It would have been awesome. Party, party. Yeah. Come on down into the house. It's going to be amazing. Until that storm hit. And then not only did they go, did he, did he lose his house, but anyone that was in that house probably went down with it. Whoa. That's not a good thought. But this person who decided to build on rock, they built, they chose their foundation when? Did they choose their foundation when the storm had come and they could see the value in it? Anyone tried to buy, build a house knows that generally speaking, builders down tools when the weather's bad. That's often why it's like, you know, you're wondering why the house is taking so long. You said, I don't know, I'm just making up a number, 20 weeks, I I'm making it up. Okay, you say 20 weeks. It's 22 and you're still only halfway through. Well, we've had bad weather. See, they don't build during the bad weather because you can't build during the bad weather. So you only build in the good weather. But you don't need the rock as a foundation. You don't need a foundation when it's, when it's good weather. You can pitch a tent. You can even glam, was it glam, glamping? You could go glamping, glamorous camping. You could go glamping in a great tent and have all the mod cons. But it's not a house. It doesn't have a foundation and you don't want to be in that thing when the wind blows and the rain comes and the hail hits. See, this person, this homeowner chose their foundation before they ever needed to have a rock as a foundation. They didn't do that. It wasn't in the heat of the moment. It wasn't in the heat of the moment when the boss came and offered the, the promotion that they try and decide what their foundation's gonna be. They think it beforehand. They decide it beforehand. And then in the moment, it's like awesome promotion, awesome pay increase, awesome phone, awesome, uh, awesome, awesome Sunday. Oh. You know what? When you've got that settled in your heart, it's not a question anymore. It's not an uncertainty. Oh, I don't know what to do. God's blessing me, but then it's going to take away. I don't, this can't be a church. It's like, really? You think that God's going to bless you and take you out of, that, out of his house? No, I don't think so. I don't believe so. But when you've got it settled in your heart, you've got your foundation set. You know, it's kind of like the Melbourne dressing layering principle thingy that I was talking about. You know, see, the, the, why, I, why did I take my parka to school in summer like a dork? <laughs> Stuff it down into my bag so nobody saw it, but I still had it with me. Why did I do that? Because it's of no value to me in my cupboard when I'm at school and the weather changes. See, we've got, we can have our things. We can have our umbrella. We can have our coat. We can have everything that we need. But if we don't have it with us, if we haven't made a decision and a choice beforehand that this, these are essentials, these are the things that I need, then it's, you know what? It's not going to do me any good. We need to understand and make the decision beforehand. So when I was thinking about it, I was thinking like, what are the essentials for us, God? Taking it out of all the rest now. What's the essentials for us? One thing I know is essentials are really glamorous. Essentials are really the latest trend. Because uh, like just taking it into clothing, okay? Strangely enough that it me, when I would take it into clothing. But take it into clothing. Your essentials are the basic things that you can wear with anything. They're not the latest trend because they won't go with everything and they come in and they go out. Your basics are never, never uh, outstanding in themselves, but they are, they are essential nonetheless. And when you need them, you know that you need them and you're very grateful that you have them. They are strong, they are real and they are effective and that's all that matters when, when you need them. So my first thought, my first essential is probably an obvious one. It is the Word, the Word of God, the Bible, what God has written in His Word to speak to us. I feel like I'm drumming this, 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 I beat this drum so much. And I feel like in, and here at Enjoy, we do beat this drum a lot. But you know what? I don't care if we beat this drum because ultimately, if we don't beat this drum from here, you're not going to beat the drum there. And I want to see you be strengthened. I want to see you blessed. I want to see you blessed. I want to see you established on a strong foundation. But you know what? You've got to read your Bible on a regular, consistent basis. 
Coming to church hopefully is beneficial to you. That is the aim. You receive fellowship. You receive, you get part of the worship. You receive the atmosphere. You get prayer. You receive the word. But you know what? If all of your diet is from here, all of your word diet is here, then you're going to be lacking. And you're going to get caught out so that when change comes, you won't have enough in the pantry to be able to do what you need to do. I know. I know in my own life that I make... When I make a commitment to read the Word of God faithfully every day, God will turn up. God will speak to me when I'm in that place. If I don't do it, then God doesn't have the same opportunity to speak to me. I'm not saying He can't speak to me any other time because He does. But what I'm doing is I'm establishing a regular appointment with my doctor. I'm doing a regular heart check and I'm allowing him to speak to anything that he needs to speak to. And allow him to show me stuff, maybe improve my eyesight, improve my heart, improve my vocabulary, improve my attitudes, speak to me. Maybe remind me of someone I need to pray for in that moment as I come into his presence and I, and I bring myself before his word. Understand that the enemy will do all he can to cut this communication. He'll tell you it's not important. He'll tell you God's not listening. He'll tell you everything he can do just to try and stop you. From, from positioning yourself and put inputting his word into your life and allowing God to communicate you. But I want to encourage you because if he gets his way, he will leave you like a ship in the middle of the ocean with no navigation system. But I want to encourage you not to allow him to do that. Be aware of what it is that God wants to do. He wants to input into your life. He wants to build into your life. And the word of God is the best thing. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. You know, many times I have been at a loss of what for what to do and God has shown me either as I've read his word or he's reminded me of something I read either that day or the day before and he's reminded me and he's given me the answer to my need and I found so many people in out the life of the church that a couple of years back when we started doing the soap journaling which stands for scripture observation application prayer so when you read your bible you look for a scripture Wait for a scripture to speak to you, then you go, observation, write that down. Application, how do I apply that today? Prayer, God help me to bring that into my world right now, from this day on. You know, I found so many people discovered that it wasn't as hard to hear from God as they thought. They thought that this was the only way they'd hear from God. It was if somebody preached and God used them to speak something into their hearts. But you know what, you don't have to wait for Sundays. This can just be the icing on the cake. This can maybe be the confirmation. This could be the encouragement. This could be something else. But God wants to speak to you on a regular basis, and He will if you allow Him by positioning yourself with His, with his Word. The second thought is good, godly friendships. You know what? You can always see the difference of the lives of those people who have good, godly friendships and those who don't. There's a difference of strength. There's a difference of confidence. There's a sense of community and support and balance and wisdom that comes through good, godly friendships. They say statistically, if you've got five or six good friends in church, that you are less likely to fall off the edge of the planet, spiritually speaking. Keeps you in a safe place. Because guess what? You're not just conversing with yourself anymore. I think God's telling me to do this. What do you think? I don't know. I think, yes, maybe He is. I don't know. What does His Word say? It could be, oh, I'll check that out. And every verse is your voice is your own. No, it's not a safe place to be. It's basically about I'm hearing voices. It's not good. But you know, at the moment you speak something out, just to start with, I don't know how many times, poor old, she mish hears it quite a bit. She hears me say something and then I go, oh, that didn't sound as good as it sounded in my head. <laughs> that didn't sound as wise as it did in my head when we're talking about stuff. And it's like, you know, sometimes you just need to get it out. And instantly you've got an answer because it's clear that what you thought might have been awesome may not have been quite as awesome as you thought. Or something that you thought was so bad is actually not as bad as you thought. So I want to encourage you, good friendships, building them into your life. Now, if you don't have at least one or two girls, if you don't have at least one or two good girlfriends, guys, if you don't have one or two good mates, and if you're married, do not make your best friend the opposite sex, someone from the opposite sex. That's just, that's just wisdom for your life. That will keep you in a safe place. If you're single, go for it. If it flips from friendship into something deeper, praise God. Who knows what God wants to do? My, I, we're always talking about the best thing to be married to your best friend. 
But you know what? If you're married, don't go confide. If you're a guy marrying and married, you don't go confiding in another woman. Go find yourself a good, godly man. If you're a girl, don't go confiding in another guy. You, 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 can, you find yourself another girlfriend who's got wisdom on her life, who's going to guide you and help you and give you strength. But we want to be those people who are just in good relationships and it holds us in a great place. And if you're in a, as a church, we provide friendship groups to help with this. Yeah, that's it. Go Beth. Pastor Beth. Everyone loves being in your friendship group, Pastor Beth. It's the best. I hear it all the time. They all love you. It's like, I'm not insecure. It's okay. They can love you. No. But they do. You know, friendship groups are the best thing ever. Best thing, they're the best thing to enable you to build great relationships. Because the back of the head in front of you is really hard to talk to on Sunday service. Plus, we're not encouraging you to talk to them. <laughs> talk to me or just listen. I don't know. <laughs> but I just really, it's the best thing. So if you're not in a friendship group, get in a friendship group. If you're in a friendship group, but you haven't found that real connection of good, of just that the people are lovely, but they're just not that connection for you, find another friendship group. It's okay. Because we want you to find your tribe. We want you to find your family. We want you to find your friends. And my final thought is commitment to God's people to, and to His house. Commitment to God's people and to His house. You know, over and over again, you see this theme repeated all through the Bible, Old Testament and New. Psalm 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. See, I love that. I love that thought. I was glad. I was excited because that's where I was going. But I love also the fact when they said to me, you know what? The best thing you can do is be encouraging everyone around you to be in the house, whether they're in the house or they're not in the house. If they've missed a week, go and ring them up and say, we missed you, come. You need to come to the house of the Lord. At Hebrews 10, 25, it says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. See, this is the place of encouragement. This is a place of our refreshing and our release. It's a place of strengthening words and a vision that lifts our eyes from whatever would seek to distract us or weigh us down. There is no place like the house of God. There isn't a place like the house of God. It's a place where heaven touches earth. You know, Jacob tells us about it in, in Genesis 28. Many of us would know these verses if you have been in enjoy for any length of time. But verse 12, it says, As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. You know what? I've read this so many times over my Christian life, and I've always thought of it as a stairway that was sent down by God so that the angels could come down and minister to us. It says the angels are ministering, saints, you know, ministering to the saints. And, uh, and I always thought that, but this time when I was preparing, I suddenly went, actually, no, this stairway wasn't built by God. This stairway actually says, it says, from the earth up to heaven. We build a stairway that allows God to send His answers, His ministering angels, His Holy Spirit, the answers and the help that we need. We build it in the house of God as we go up. Because then it goes to verse 17 and it says, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway of heaven. You know what? When suddenlies occur and we're anchored and abiding in the house of God, in regular attendance and regular service, we will find ourselves well equipped to deal with whatever those moments and whatever those seasons contain. But let's not wait until we're in the storm. Because I gotta tell you, you're gonna need a whole lot more help to try and build it when you're in the storm. Let's be those people who say, you know what, God, you have spoken to me. You know what's ahead. You've spoken to me. You're, you're, you're um, equipping me. You're encouraging me, you're teaching me and training me so that I will be well in this season to come. So that when you come and you do what you want to do, the suddenly that I'm asking you for, God, that as I, as I, I, you're speaking to me and you're, you're preparing me so that when they come, I'm ready for them. My life is prepared to handle everything that comes and I don't get knocked off my feet. And I don't get knocked to the ground and I'm not adrift. And I'm not wondering where, where is God and what do I do? The word godly friendships and commitment to God's house and to His people. You know what? If you do that, you will be established. You will be strong and you'll be able to go exactly where God wants to take you, ready to receive everything He has for you. Amen? Amen. Amen.